Hi, welcome to the video. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Simon. I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking to you about books that I've read recently whilst wearing a shirt that's never seen an iron in its life. <laughs> In this video, I'm gonna be talking about Infinitesimal by Amir Alexander, Consider Phlebas by Ian M. Banks, What If by Randall Munro, and Longitude by Dava Sabel. Links to the Amazon pages for all of these books are down there in the description, though where you can, please do try and buy books from your local bookshop because they're really worth supporting. I've also reviewed all the books I've talked about in this video on Goodreads. I have a Goodreads profile, which I'll again link down there. Um, I, I don't understand Goodreads particularly, but if you'd like to follow or friend, me, um, you, you can do those things and I'll, I'll accept whatever. So yeah, you can see what I'm reading and, and um, my v crude attempts at, at book reviews there. First up is Infinitesimal. This is a book about, well, ostensibly it's a book about a mathematical idea, which is the idea that you can take a curve, uh, any curve, and you can break it down into an infinite number of infinitely small straight lines. Um, this is an idea that's actually been around since the Greeks, but it only really uh, came to the, the fore of, of, of mathematics in the 17th century. And um, the book says it's about that. Really, I think, the book is about authoritarianism in the 17th century. It's split into two. The first half of the book, Ish, is set in Italy, and it looks at how the authorities in Italy, in particular the Catholic Church, responded to this idea. And uh, the second half of the book, Ish, <laughs> the first half is actually quite a bit longer, um, is set in England and it's to do with how the state responded to the idea. Now, while that seems like quite a small uh, remit for a book and maybe a little bit boring, um, this ties into an awful lot of themes that go way, way further into the future. Um, the outcome of, well, we know what the outcome was. We know um, that Italy after the 17th century didn't produce any great mathematicians. Sorry, I've realized that maybe a lot of you don't know that. Well, England then went on to produce some of the greatest minds in human history, like Isaac Newton and um, the book you know, links it really the outcome of those two nations responding to this idea in two different ways, depending on the degree of authoritarianism in those countries, um, to the fact that Britain went into the Industrial Revolution and then enjoyed an empire, whereas Italy didn't and lagged behind the rest of Northern Europe for quite some time. Sorry, Western, Northwestern Europe, really. Um, and it, it, it touches on that, it introduces uh, concepts of philosophy, it talks about Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, because uh, Hobbes thought of himself as a mathematician, even though he went to his grave convinced that he'd actually accomplished what we've now proven to be an impossible feat, which is squaring the circle. And also the first part gives a very interesting history of um, the Jesuit order, which is a <laughs> really basically a militant part of the Catholic Church. Well, back then it was founded as uh, soldiers for the Pope, effectively, um, and they went on to become hugely influential in Italy and they were one of the key, uh, key groups of people that railed against this idea of um, uh, this mathematical idea. Now, if it sounds strange to you that the state in England and the Catholic Church in Italy should be concerned with an idea like the fact that curves can be broken down into, small, into straight lines, read this book because um, it... <sighs> It's not a part of history I'd ever considered before because it links maths, you know, very, very abstract concept to real life concerns and um, it makes, makes links that are perfectly logical and impeccably researched, I should point out. You know, there's a huge number of references at the end of this. Um, in, in many ways, it's more of an academic book than a, a popular fiction book. It's a little bit too dense for its own good sometimes, actually, if I had a criticism of it. Um, also, the narrative in the first part is a little bit pseudo chronologically it goes chronologically and then goes back on itself and then back on itself um, which i find a little bit annoying um, but it does it, it argues its case very eloquently and uh, very satisfyingly actually it ends a little bit abruptly but um if, if you're interested in the history of maths and how maths has influenced the world or even if you're just interested in in europe in the 17th century i i'd recommend this one Next up, something completely different. Ian M. Banks is Consider Phlebas. Um, this is the first book in the Culture series of novels by Banks. Um, uh, and it's the first book of that uh, series that I've read. It's actually the first book of this real genre, like hard sci-fi that I've, I've read. Um, and it took me a long time to get into it. I'll definitely say that. Um, similarly to Infinitesimal, it can be quite dense. In fact, um, somebody commented on a video where I talked about this before, about the fact that um, they, they struggle to read Ian Banks because his imagination is so vivid, you have to sit and think for a bit about what he's actually talking about. The ideas are just so out there that you you kind of have to sit and think, right, right. 
Oh, it goes around the world. But as world building goes, I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the um, Warhammer 40,000 universe and the books that are associated with that. And that is a very dense, deep, deep world that's been built by, by well, dozens, hundreds even of people. This is one guy, and the depth he's crafted is just astonishing. Uh, it's like um, Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials in the depth of the world that's been created, um, and it's. Um, it's very satisfying from the world building level. The plot is also different to what you'd expect from sci-fi. In a lot of sci-fi, um, Doctor Who is a great example, you will find a protagonist that changes the overarching situation of uh, uh, that's been, that the story is set in. And in this book, it's the exact, well, it's not the exact opposite. The protagonist and the events of the book have next to no impact. In fact, they basically have no impact on the, the setting, on, on the great war that's going on in the background. The small events of this book, and they really are quite small, don't have any impact, and I quite I found that quite refreshing. Mostly, this is about personal interactions and introducing uh, this amazing world of the the culture, which is like a communist utopia in the far future, where machines are uh, far far more intelligent than people and uh, you know, have rights associated with them, um, and, and contrasting that with a, um, a very warlike theocracy of, of an alien race. Um, and, uh, and the character's viewpoints, or well, the main character at least, viewpoint, changing on the two sides as the book goes on. The prose, incidentally, is really quite lovely. It's not beautiful in a lyrical sense, but every now and again a sentence just catches you, and I really love that. I'm not quite sure who I'd recommend it to. If you're into sci-fi and you haven't read it, definitely, definitely read it. If, like me, you find ideas of machine consciousness interesting, I can also recommend this. Also, if you like quite pulpy sci-fi, Dip your toe in this and see what you make of it, because based on this, I'm going to give some of his other books a go, I think. Um, maybe not quite yet, because I've got a lot on my reading list as it is. But um, I, I enjoyed it, though I will warn that it is, yeah, quite dense. Next up, something completely different again, What If by Randall Munro. I'm not going to spend too long talking about this. Um, this is a collection of um, Randall Munro's responses to his fantastic blog, uh, What If, which um, you know, it's online, you can read it for free. This is just uh, a collection, and I think a few extra ones as well, in print form. If you if you like problem solving, basically, if you're thinking of going to uni to do a science subject, or if you're at uni doing a science subject, goodness sake, read this book. Um, and in particular, if you're preparing for Oxford physics interviews or, or Cambridge Natural Sciences, in fact, generally Oxford science interviews, read this because the the questions aren't the important thing. How he tackles the questions, the the, the process by which he attacks a problem is exactly what they're looking for in interviews uh, and it's also an awful lot of fun like an example question from what height would you need to drop a steak for it to be cooked when it hit the ground now that's a question that will have no practical impact on your life whatsoever but the process by which he answers it is fantastic so yeah if you're a scientist or if you if you're geeky and like solving problems give this one a read Next and last for this video, Longer Cheap by Darvis Abel. This is a really wee little book. Look, it's like 170 pages long. Um, and it is about the creation. I've still got my bookmark in there. It's a train ticket. It is about the creation and invention of um, the first maritime clocks. So um, basically determining latitude, so the distance from the north you are from the North Pole, downwards if you like, um, is easy. You can do that by looking at the stars. Anybody who was at sea could, could do that very easily. Um, but longitude is more difficult. There was no easy way to determine your longitude uh, up until the events of this book, which takes place in the 18th century. And that was a big problem. People would crash and die all the time. And there were two techniques which uh, people came up with to determine longitude. One was to set a clock to London time and then to observe where you were, what the noon was. And then the difference in time between your clock and your observation gave you how far east or west you were. And the second technique was to use an astronomical method, which had its flaws. In fact, they both had their flaws, because clocks, up until the events of this book, at least, were just not accurate on ships. And that was the case until this man. Sorry, I missed him. <laughs> there he is. This man, John Harrison, came around. And the story of um, him inventing uh, these clocks uh, is, is it's very interesting, and um, how he he had personal competition with the astronomical method uh, by the Royal Astronomer Royal, who I, I think is villainized a bit unfairly in this book, but it makes for an interesting narrative. Basically, this is, yeah, it's very light, and it's frothy, it is not an academic text, it is very easy to read, very short chapters, only about 10 pages, um, so it, it's ideal to read before bed, which is how I read um, a lot of it. In fact, I read about half of it fully on the way to go and see the clocks um, that Harrison made, which are at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, which is a lovely place. Um, and and you can you can see uh, if you live in London the the clocks that are there, which are beautiful. I've got to say, it's a little inconsequential. Um, it, it doesn't really stick with you 
that much after you don't get the impression of reading anything particularly profound. But it's enjoyable. If you if you're if you're after just something kind of light to read in bed, then give this one a go. And that's all I have for you in this video. Uh, the schedule for this video series is basically going to be determined by how fast I read stuff. Um, I, I this this represents about five weeks of reading. I think I've been reading quite a lot recently, um, and it depends on how much time I have for my PhD and if I have good stuff to read and I feel inclined to read it. Um, in the next video. I'm currently finishing off Game of Thrones. I'm on book six and I've got book seven just by my bedside table. Um, so hopefully next video I will have burned through the next, oh god, about a thousand pages. Um, and I'll do a, a sort of series review of the whole thing. Um, if you Maybe if you've seen the, the show and you haven't read the books and you want someone to give you a, a skinny of what they're like, then that will be what that video is like. Um, and then I've also got coming up Galileo's Daughter. I've got a Gerald Dora book. I've got a movie review book. In fact, I've got two movie books. I've got uh, Gene, uh, Gene Kranz's autobiography, a uh, book on quantum mechanics. Uh, there's, I, 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 could, I could do this series for quite a while, I think. What I'd like to do in this series, however, is if you are in the middle of reading Game of Thrones, maybe, or, or, or if you're just, if you've been thinking about it, maybe you'd like to start reading them. Next video, let's have a discussion in the comments thread about Game of Thrones and what we think of the books and maybe comparisons to them. And um, I hope for the, the next one, um, maybe the fact that it will ever come out. Um, uh, but and in this video, I'd like you, if you've read these books down below, to comment. Maybe maybe give them a quick review of your own. Um, and if you, based on this video, go and read them. Come back, leave a review. Um, I'd really really like to get some kind of interaction with you because I know the people that watch this channel are big into books like me because you're all geeks, basically. You're all geeks, and I love talking to fellow geeks. So uh, uh, that that in that conversation is something I'm really really looking forward to having. If you have recommendations. Uh, for stuff that I should read, and I already have about a million based on my favourite books video, which incidentally, if you didn't know is a thing, I'll put that up there. Um, if, if you have recommendations, perhaps based on the fact of what I liked and disliked about these books, put them down below. I'm, I'm keen to see what you guys suggest, and um, yeah, we'll go from there. It's quite exciting starting a new series. If you like this video, do give it a like and share it with your, your book-loving friends, and um, hopefully I'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you very much for watching. The way I describe it to my friends is it's like um, literary dark chocolate. You don't want much, you want a little bit at a time, and when you do have a little bit at a time, it's really, really good. You have to savour it. Um, not one for everyone. If you feel if you feel like ambitious, then give it a go. My friend face against the glass and just say, oh look, it's a one time. But it does raise the question of the me which I I personally think that I am, and the me, the me which I put on display, if you like. It's like an online persona.